Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to return to the, the reading and uh, uh, explanation, comment of this book, The Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives, and we're into Chapter 6 now of uh, the last portion of this book. And we're going to deal specifically with John Carroll this morning. John Carroll, the Jesuit priest. He and his cousin, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, uh, Charles Carroll II, if you will, were sent as youngsters to Europe for their education. Charles Carroll was educated in secular matters. And John Carroll was trained as a Jesuit priest. Both very privileged individuals, both very powerful and influential people in the, in the formation of, uh, uh, the Roman Catholic Church in America after, and fomenting the Revolutionary War. We're going to deal specifically with the Jesuit now, John Carroll. And, uh, this, these subjects are largely overlooked by many researchers. And, uh, was recommended by John Daniel that we here at Inquisition Update and hopefully the listeners will take an interest in the Carroll family and their influence and what results today of their influence early in the colonial period. Now, we know that the Jesuit order was suppressed in 1773. John Carroll was a Jesuit. And the great mission of the Roman Catholic Church at that period of time was the American colonies, how to get control of the American colonies. Uh, in, in, and do it at the same time of so much religious unrest in Great Britain between Protestants and Catholics. How could they survive in the colonies? How could Catholics survive in the colonies? How could they preserve the Roman Catholic Church so that it would prosper in the new colonies? The colonies separate from Europe, a long distance away, and that if Protestant uprising, such as it existed in England, erupted in the colonies, how could Catholicism su- survive? And, and this is the key question that needs to be asked and answered. Now, our focus on John Carroll. It says, during the period from the signing of the Declaration of Independence to the session of the First Congress of the United States, Father John Carroll... I'll just add the Jesuit priest, Father John Carroll of Rock Creek, Maryland, was the leading exponent of religious liberty in the New Republic. Now, before I even continue, Jesuitism is a most profoundly Catholic institution. It is the greatest of all defenders of the papacy's supreme power in the world, both temporally and spiritually. They are ultramontane. No religious liberty. Catholicism is the one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church, and it has a vicar ahead of all the churches, the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, and he has divine right to rule the world. That's what the Jesuit order is all about. Now, are we to believe that John Carroll, who is a sworn Jesuit, trained in Jesuit schools, trained to be a Jesuit of all Jesuits, is is promoting religious liberty in the colonies, in the New Republic? This is contrary to the the heart, blood, and soul of Jesuitism. But here in this book, we are to believe, as this author states, that 
Father John Carroll of Rock Creek, Maryland, was the leading exponent of religious liberty in the New Republic. Now, I want my listeners to realize that if this is true, he is running diametrically counter to his sworn oath as a Jesuit. And his oath of allegiance to the superior, the, the superior general, the Jesuit general, the, the black pope. And in direct defiance of his vicar in Rome, the pope of Rome, and in defiance of the official teaching of the magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church and canon law, if he is indeed an exponent of religious liberty in the New Republic. Now, if we can believe everything that we know at Inquisition Update about the Roman Catholic Church, John Carroll would be labeled a heretic and a schismatic for being an exponent of religious liberty anywhere in the world. But was he hauled into the Inquisition? No. He was left in this country for a purpose. And we're going to find out what that purpose is. He says, no member of the clergy in his day was more thoroughly American in thought and spirit. Another lie by this author. This may be the belief of this author, but he says, no member of the clergy in his day was more thoroughly American. Let me tell you, a Jesuit is, is papist not American. A Jesuit has no nation. They have no allegiance to any nation in which they dwell. They can't serve their Jesuit general if they have any fealty toward the land in which they live or the people that dwell therein. A Jesuit has one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to extirpate heresy and to bring the papacy to world supremacy. The goal of the Jesuit order has not changed since the date of its founding in 1540. In, in 1540. Not one ounce of their determination has waned. Jesuit John Carroll for all the, the the statements of this book to the contrary, was not an American. He was a Jesuit. And we must not forget that. And it says, as Dr. Gilday, the researcher, Dr. Gilday, in his Life and Times of John Carroll says, quote, no American living caught so quickly and indelibly the spirit that created the new republic, unquote. Now, let me tell you, he, he's, he's being put forth as an American of all Americans, just as was his cousin. Remember First Citizen John, John, or Charles Carroll II? John, uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton? You know, First Citizen? Not only of Maryland, but also of the colonies, first citizen, the one who was appointed to the, to the, to the, uh, Department of War, led a campaign to go to, to, uh, Canada to elicit the support of the Catholics in Canada for the revolution, a prime mover and shaker in the secular world, in the, in the colonies, and now we have John Carroll, the Jesuit priest, also being touted as a great American. Both served their little god in Rome. Their first and foremost fealty is to Rome, the vicar of Christ. Let us not forget this. And it says, this biographer, speaking again of uh, Dr. Gilday, this biographer has made a most valuable contribution to American history, for he has brought to light facts relating to the organization of the Catholic Church in the United States that have not been generally known and recognized 
And as a result of his scholarly research, the church has been given a place of prominence in the early history of the nation that it did not occupy before, not even in the minds of most Catholics. That's key to understand that there's much more to the formation of the Catholic Church in the colonies and in America than even Catholics realize. And that's, that's one of the biggest things we're going to focus on in this chapter. What is the purpose of the Catholic Church in the colonies? That purpose that even most Catholics don't realize, much less the Protestants. <clears throat> now, when John Carroll and his cousin Charles Carroll of Carrollton left Maryland for France in the beginning of their studies at the College of St. Omer, that's when they were just little kids, sent on the boat to go back to the mainland Europe to go to St. Omer's College. It was to be a course of preparation for them to become men of leadership and vision, each in his own field. Now, this author is admitting that these kids were groomed for a specific mission a specific purpose in the colonies. And St. Omer's was where that mission was to be given to them. It says, The college was made up of young men preparing for life in the world and of young men preparing for the priesthood. All right, St. Omer's <clears throat> trained Charles Carroll for a distinct purpose and life in the world, a secular uh, mission in the colonies. And St. Omer's also prepared Jesuit priest John Carroll for a religious mission in the colonies. All right? It said it was accepted as the best school, that is, St. Omer's, the best school for the sons of English Catholics during the penal period. And it was also the house of studies for the Jesuits who were to be sent to the English and American missions. All right. What does this tell us? It tells us that if you are Catholic and you have children of bright minds, and you want to put them on a papal mission, send them to St. Omer's. If you want them to be warriors for the Pope in England and in the colonies, send them to St. Omer's. That's where the Vatican focused all of its attention in training students as as those who would accomplish the Vatican's purposes, both in England and the colonies. St. Omer's was set aside and made a special uh, mill to grind out warriors for the Pope. And it says of all the continental schools, in other words, all the schools, the Catholic schools of Europe, it, meaning St. Omer's, was the best loved by the boys of Maryland. Who is he speaking of? Charles and John Carroll, the Carroll family. Best, it was the school best loved by the boys of Maryland. And he says, uh, and he says, and Maryland can be looked upon to a great extent as St. Omer's mission. All right, St. Omer's, the, the, the school, chose Maryland as its great mission. So Maryland had a specific purpose in the colonies, as established by the Jesuits at St. Omer's, and so did the Carroll boys. They, they, they were groomed by St. Omer's to, to uh, accomplish a great mission in the colonies. In other words... The Carroll boys aren't just ordinary, run-of-the-mill American Catholics. No. They've got a powerful mission to accomplish. 
They're hand, they're hand picked. They're picked men. And it says, after leaving St. Omer's, the lives of these two Maryland boys were to drift apart for a space of years and until their return to America when their talents and ideals were to be welded in the building of a new nation. Let me read that again. Just capture this, will you? After leaving St. Omer's, the lives of these two Maryland boys were to drift apart for a space of years and until their return to America, when their talents and ideals were to be welded in the building of a new nation. That captures the, the essence of the special mission for which Charles and, and, and John Carroll were selected. Building a new nation. When Charles Carroll went to the Jesuit College at Reims for the advancement of his secular education, John Carroll entered the Jesuit novitiate at Watton. After completing his novitiate, he, per he pursued his course of philosophy at Liege and then returned to St. Omer's to teach the classics. When St. Omer's was confiscated by the French government and transferred to the English secular clergy, after the Edict of the Parliament of Paris suppressing the Jesuits in France, Carroll accompanied a detachment of students on a long overland journey afoot to the college at Bruges, Belgium. Here he remained, with the exception of a year's travel in Germany and Italy, until 1773, when by Edict of the Pope, there came the general suppression of the Jesuits. The act of suppression came as a severe shock to Father Carroll. He wrote to his brother Daniel in Maryland that he was not and perhaps never would be recovered from the blow of this dreadful intelligence, meaning the knowledge of the suppression of the Jesuits. It was a devastating blow to John Carroll because it seemed to put a kink in his mission. The suppression of the Jesuits seemed for all intents and purposes to banish the Jesuit order, and his mission in the colonies would have come to an end. But we, in fact, discover in this book that his mission didn't come to an end at all, and neither did that of Charles Carroll. It continues, it says, the greatest blessing he, received, he could receive from God would be, quote, immediate death, but if he deny me this, may his holy and adorable designs on me be wholly fulfilled, unquote. So, when the knowledge of the suppression of the Jesuits became known to John Carroll, he says that his immediate death would, would satisfy him. You think he was de dedicated to the Jesuit order? But if God spared him immediate death, then would God bless his designs and that they be fully fulfilled? So I I'm, in I'm interpreting from this that the suppression of the Jesuits did nothing but strengthen the resolve of John Carroll. That if God didn't take him out of this world, then he prayed that God would give him complete fulfillment of his designs. Well, John Carroll didn't die. So you must know that he set about to do what he was purposed to do. He's a committed man. His entire life is dedicated to a mission that he has accepted. And that is, that has everything to do with, with building and growing the Roman Catholic Church in the colonies. And it says, as he wondered, <clears throat> what would become of the flourishing congregations in Maryland and Pennsylvania? He decided to return to Maryland where he would have, quote, 
the comfort not only of being with you, that is his family, or Charles Carroll, but of being further out of the reach of the scandal and defamation and removed from the scene of distress of many of my dearest friends whom God knows I shall not be able to relieve. In other words, he's talking about uh, the scandal surrounding the Jesuit order after their suppression and that it being disbanded that uh, he would not be able to relieve any of his retiring Jesuits in, in uh, the continuation of the official uh, missions of the Jesuit order. But trust me, the Jesuit order didn't go away. It just went underground. John Carroll is going to continue with his mission just as the Jesuits did, even during their suppression. And he says, I shall therefore, uh, therefore most certainly sail for Maryland early next spring if I possibly can. So he's coming to Maryland. He's been transferred. The Jesuit order has been suppressed. Ha, hardy, har, har. And now he's coming to Maryland. And it says, Father Carroll's situation was desperate, for he had renounced all claim to his father's estate, and there was no, ins no assurance that he would receive support from the property of the suppressed society in America. So the author is telling us that when he became a Jesuit, as we know Jesuits must do, they have to surrender all personal property. They can't own anything. And his inheritance from his father's estate, would have been gobbled up by the Jesuit order. It would have, been, it would have become the property of, of the Society of Jesus. So he had no estate to support him when he came to Maryland. And then also that he would uh, not receive support from any of the property owned and controlled by the Suppressed Society of Jesus in America. Now that the Jesuit order is disbanded, he couldn't count on being the benefit of anything that the Jesuits controlled. So, so he's coming back to Maryland with the clothes on his back and, and, and nothing waiting in, the, in Maryland to support him. So he's, de he's dependent upon a higher power for his survival because he's committed everything to the Jesuit order. <clears throat> and it says he received an invitation from Lord Arendale, descendant of Lord Baltimore's friend, to make his home in Wardour Castle and to act as chaplain to the family and to the Catholics in the neighborhood. But the news he had received from America led him to decline this, off this offer. The life of a private chaplain in England offered no inducement to him when there was an impending struggle between the American colonies and the mother country. Now, why would this be so? Because the Jesuits were known in England to be the fomenters of war. And there was going to be, a, 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 you know, the war of, of independence. And Jesuits would be suspect. And Catholics would be persecuted. And so that there was very little hope for John Carroll, the Jesuit priest, in, in a period of heightened tension between the colonies and Britain. So it, life looks pretty bleak, bleak uh, for this Jesuit priest. All means of support are gone, and he is a Jesuit, labeled as suppressed. And we'll talk more about it when we get back. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. 
If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Dot org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, welcome back to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. All roads lead to Rome, listeners. Our Bible tells us that it will be a Roman Empire that exists at the time of Christ's return. Why? Ask yourself, why does the mainstream and alternative medias avoid any discussion about Rome when God made it clear, unmistakably clear, that it would be a Roman Empire in power? at the time of Christ's return. We can connect all the dots for you. And we can help you connect all the dots for all your friends and family. Now, helping to continue to connect all the dots, we have a Jesuit priest, a suppressed Jesuit, John Carroll, coming to Maryland after the suppression for a purpose. And it's it's important for us to know what that purpose was, to help explain what's happening in our country today. And that's the purpose of Inquisition Update, to connect these dots. Now, John Carroll. It says, The life of a private chaplain in England offered no inducements to John Carroll when there was an impending struggle between the American colonies and the mother country, England. Now, why would, why would England be regarded as John Carroll as no inducement at all to him? 
during this period of struggle between the American colonies and Great Britain. Because any war would have brought further suppression of the Jesuits in England, as if more suppression was even possible, and suppression of Catholicism would would have, I mean, England would have clamped down on on Catholicism during this period. Remembering the history of England, where the Vatican consistently and persistently and repeatedly, perpetually tried to regain its control of England. England was just soaked in religious unrest. Suspicion of the Vatican, suspicion of the Jesuits, suspicion of Roman Catholic priests, suspicion of Roman Catholic laity and citizens of England, government-sponsored suppression of Catholicism out of a means of just self-preservation. And now we have the colonies rising up against Britain. Is this just another Vatican attempt? Would would I mean we can easily see how John Carroll would see no inducement uh, in England for any priestly activities. So he came back to Maryland in the spring of 1774, just one year after the suppression of the Jesuits, and it says this was a, mon, uh, a momentous decision, for had he decided not to return to America. And to have remained in England, the course of events immediately following the war for independence might and probably would have been far different. So what what is this telling you? That John Carroll made a great deal of difference by coming to Maryland. And had he stayed in England, the outcome might have been different, far different. So this author is admitting the role that John Carroll played. Now, he comes back to Maryland, and it says, At the home of his mother at Rock Creek, Father John Carroll assembled a congregation of Catholics. The little congregation grew so rapidly that it was found necessary to erect a a church, St. John's, a short distance from his mother's home, became the first Catholic church in Maryland under the secular clergy erected by a congregation which supported a pastor. Until this time, the Jesuit fathers had carried on the service of religion at their own expense. So now he's being supported by this little congregation. And it says, as Charles Carroll of Carrollton visioned the political and economic future of America, Father John Carroll looked beyond the years and foresaw, listen to this, he looked beyond the years and foresaw the growth of his church, the Roman Catholic Church, and the place it was to occupy in the life of the nation. You suppose uh, that John Carroll was that intuitive? Or was he just simply schooled at St. Omer's about what the Vatican's mission for America was and knew beforehand that Rome had set designs on the Catholic Church in America and it was John Carroll's purpose to come to the colonies and to give birth and growth to that church. That's exactly what's happened here. John Carroll's no mystic. He's simply been told by the Jesuit general what they're going to do in America. He's just fulfilling his mission. And it says, under the inspiration of his leadership, it became a church especially American. That's a key phrase. It became a church essentially American, and at the same time truly Catholic. Now, what does that imply? That this Catholic church that John Carroll is founding in America 
is going to call itself Catholic. It's going to be essentially Catholic, but especially American. In other words, it's not going to have the same ultramontane characteristic as all Catholic churches around the world have. It's going to be a national church. It's going to be uniquely American. It's going to be different than any Roman Catholic church around the world. And it has to be different. And we're going to explain and understand why this Roman Catholic church, this American Roman Catholic church, has to be unique. It has to be especially American. While maintaining the tenets of Catholicism, it has to be a loyal American church. Now, that's different than any Roman Catholic church, because every Roman Catholic church, in no matter what country in the world it exists, its loyalty, direction, and control is Rome. And it is seen as, it is seen by the people in those nations as an enclave of Rome. And that's what bred so much suspicion of Roman Catholicism, especially in Britain. That each Roman Catholic church is essentially, um, what's the word I want to use? An embassy of Rome. And now at the, at the time of the revolution, uh, when, when Catholicism had developed such a notorious history in Britain of government, uh, uh, infiltration and subversion, trying to overthrow the British crown, it, America, American Catholicism for it to survive had to appear for all intents and purposes to be an American embassy not a Roman embassy. And it was up to John Carroll to get this church started and to get it on a patriotic footing <clears throat> so that it could survive. Because had John Carroll started this Roman Catholic church and began to take its orders and its hierarchical structure and development according to Rome's decree, this heightened distrust between Protestants and Catholics would have exploded. And the Catholic Church would have been suppressed in the colonies, and Catholics would have been persecuted in the colonies, just as they were in Great Britain. And it was essential for this, this religious unrest not to rear its ugly head until... The revolution was complete. The independence of America was signed. And the Roman Catholic Church was established as a uniquely American church. It's a, it's a big mission to accomplish, considering the distrust between the largely Protestants, the Protestant colonies, and and the Catholics in the country, who had already been suppressed in Maryland and other places. And it says, previous to the Revolution, the Catholic Church in America had been a mission. Okay, that's an admission that the Vatican saw America, as it did Britain, as a mission. Something to accomplish. In other words, an overthrow or a, you know, a, a planting of the seed of revolt. A mission of, of specific interest to the Vatican. Okay? And it said there was no juridic or ecclesiastical control except that of the superior who in turn was sub subject to the jurisdiction of the English province. With the suppression of the Jesuit order, the churches and chapels came under the jurisdiction of the Vicar Apostolic of London. At the outbreak of the war, a serious problem confronted the American Catholics. For ten years, writes Dr. Gilday, quote, the work in the American vineyard went on in a listless way, as it was bound to, 
without a shepherd, and manned by a little group of priests who had been dishonored and disbanded by the Holy See. Who's he talking about? The Jesuits who existed in the colonies. They had been disbanded by the Holy See. But for the first time in this book, it's admitted that the Jesuits were in control of the Catholics in the country. This book up till now has, has downplayed the role of the Jesuits in, Amer- in the colonies. And had, had been under the control of a band of priests who had been dishonored and disbanded by the Holy See, the Jesuit priests. It says, priests and laity turned instinctively to Father Carroll for leadership. Now, there you go. There's the result of his, of his education at St. Omer's and the special mission given to him. Catholics turned their attention and reliance upon John Carroll, the man with the plan. And John Carroll responded with his plan of organization of 1782. The Jesuits had control of considerable real property, in other words, real estate in Maryland and Pennsylvania, and the proper administration of this property was of a most vexing problem. Why? Because the Jesuits were suppressed. They had no right to property everywhere else. The property is being confiscated. The Jesuit priests were being suppressed. And now he's in charge of considerable real property in Maryland and and Pennsylvania. And it says, Father Carroll, in his plan, placed upon the clergy of the two states, Maryland and uh, Pennsylvania, the obligations arising from justice and charity of using the funds entrusted their predecessors and to themselves solely for the spiritual uplift of the faithful and for the sustenance of the clergy. An arrangement of checks and balances such as is found in the American form of government was agreed upon among themselves. There was to be a general meeting of the clergy, each distinct elect, each district electing a representative. So they've got to form their own government, their own form of ecclesiastical checks and balances. They're, they're somewhat, you know, separated from Rome. It's an isolated group of Roman Catholics trying to form a church in, in a period of war, wartime. <clears throat> and John Carroll's the man to get this done. And it says, Father Carroll, aware of the unjust confiscation of Jesuit property in Europe. Now, we're talking about during the suppression. They've lost everything. He calls it the unjust confiscation of the Jesuit property in Europe was not unmindful that similar action might be taken in America. And it says, in true American spirit, he wrote to his friend, Father Charles Plowden, in London, quote, Your information of the intention of the propaganda gives me concern no, fur- no farther than to hear that men whose institution was for the service of religion should bend their thoughts so much more to grasping for power and the commanding of wealth, for may, for they may be assured that they will never get possession of a sixpence of our property here. And if any of our friends could be weak enough to deliver any real estate into their hands or attempt to subject it to their authority, our civil government would be called upon to wrest it again out of their dominion. A foreign temporal jurisdiction will never listen to this. A foreign temporal jurisdiction. This Now, that phrase could apply to the Pope, right? A foreign temporal jurisdiction will never be tolerated here, and even the spiritual supremacy of the Pope is the only reason why in some of the United States the full participation of all civil rights are not granted to the Roman Catholics. They may therefore send their agents when they please. They will certainly return empty-handed. 
So the new American government's not going to tolerate any foreign interference or any uh, confiscation of Jesuit property because this Catholic Church is an American church, essentially is what he's saying. So he's going to preserve all these landed properties that are owned and controlled by the Jesuits in spite of their suppression. And he's going to get help from the secular government. And it says, John Carroll, as a good Catholic, never questioned the spiritual supremacy of the Pope. But he was at all times anxious to see that the temporal jurisdiction of the papacy would not intrude itself into the plan of organization of the Church of America. Now, let me make sure the listeners understand. John Carroll, the Jesuit John Carroll, in acknowledging the superior, the, the spiritual supremacy of the Pope, tacitly acknowledges the temporal authority of the Pope. Because the spiritual authority of the Pope in the world cannot sustain itself without the support of his temporal authority. Do you understand what I'm saying? Throughout all of Roman Catholic history, the papacy consistently relies upon the temporal power of the Pope and his control of the civil governments to order them to accomplish his bidding in the world to raise his spiritual authority. <clears throat> if the papacy doesn't carry a sword, then it cannot impose the Pope's spiritual control on the world. So the temporal authority of the, of the papacy must exist. It must carry the sword. It must use the civil powers to accomplish its spiritual supremacy in the world. So despite what this says, if John Carroll acknowledges the Pope's spiritual supremacy, he tacitly acknowledges the Pope's temporal authority in the world. Despite his renunciation that we can't have the Pope's temporal power being an influence here in the colonies or Catholicism can't survive. We need our own independent, uniquely American Catholic arrangement, separate from control of Rome, so as not to excite the fear and the jealousies of the Protestants in the country. Because if we get the the Protestants back on the same attitude that the Protestants had in Britain, they'll suppress us here just like they did in Britain. So we have to at least on the surface renounce and shun and put away any interference from Rome, we have to raise up this Roman Catholic Church under our own authority to so we can preserve it. This is a whole new situation here. A whole continent separate, uh, of North America separated by the Atlantic Ocean, completely cut off, from any real practical support and defense. Look, if, if the Catholics tried to uprise in the colonies as they did in Great Britain, where would they get their support? All their support would have to come from Europe. They'd been route, they would have been routed. The Roman Catholic Church would have been finally suppressed in the colonies before it ever got a foothold. So to minimize those suppress, those suspicions, to minimize those tensions, to survive, to fight another day, they have to take a temporary approach to distance themselves from Rome, to distance themselves from European influence, and to just rely on John Carroll and his entourage, whatever influence that he can, that he can muster in the colonies, to make the Roman Catholic Church to build it, and to help it survive until it can sustain itself and to raise itself to supremacy in the, in this country, to raise itself to a position of capability 
that it could do what it's doing today. I mean, this man, John Carroll, is a subject that needs to be focused on. John Carroll, as a good Catholic, never questioned the spiritual supremacy of the Pope, but he was at all times anxious to see that the temporal jurisdiction of the papacy would not intrude itself into the plan of organization of the church in America. I will just clarify, of the Roman Catholic Church in America. His attitude was always uncompromising on all points of doctrine, but in temporal matters and affairs of government, he believed in rendering unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In other words, separation of church and state. That's what we've got to have. We have to have a separation of church and state, a temporary disposal of the temporal authority of the Pope, leave the government alone, stay out of government affairs, let the church survive on its own without the help of the government, and maybe we'll fight another day. And that day is today. That day is today. What John Carroll accomplished early in the formation of the Roman Catholic Church, the American Roman Catholic Church, is the beginning of the horror that is about to unfold in the United States today. A horror that is largely ignored by the mainstream media. We'll continue tomorrow on Inquisition Update. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur's Across the Board. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? 
who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.